Hello everyone, welcome to Skillcapped. My name is Jack and in this guide we'll be opening up our strategy book from the recent Allied Esports Odyssey tournament. Allied Esports Odyssey was a six team tournament, but despite that it showcased the two best teams in Europe in G2 and Team Liquid, as well as teams close at their heels in Fun Plus Phoenix and Ninjas in Pajamas, as well as more. We'll be going over how the best players in the world read the game to get ahead of their competition, as well as thrive in the most tense clutch situations. We'll also go over the best strategies and setups employed along the way. From even more development in the Bind A metagame to some of the best coordinated takes on Split, and finally, the most lethal lockdown defense on Ascent. Whether you're grinding rank solo, trying to improve, or running with your team and trying to coordinate new strats, this video will have something for you to start getting more kills and winning more games. But before we get into that, are you struggling to win gunfights? Well, don't worry, we've got you covered at skillcap.com. You'll finally learn how to level up your aim, different techniques to win gunfights, and so much more. We have professional courses on every single agent, map, and mechanic in Valorant. This is backed by the top pros, players, and coaches to make sure you're getting the most up-to-date and accurate info possible. In fact, we're so confident that you'll improve using our system that we offer a rank improvement guarantee. Check it out yourself in the link below. Simply put in what rank you're currently stuck at and find out what rank you're guaranteed by using our system. So what are you waiting for? Unlock your true potential and get the rank you've always wanted at skillcap.com, link in the description down below. We're getting started today with the most interesting rounds showcased on Bind. Starting off with the first match of the playoffs between NIP and Team Liquid. We're here on round 4 and it's a pivotal one early on for this Liquid side. As we covered in my previous video between them and G2, Liquid are still heavily favoring the force buy after pissed around loss strategy, and they ended up losing this force buy, allowing Nip to run up the duty free 3 0 lead. This is the first full buy gun round, and Liquid definitely want the security to start running up some momentum for themselves. Another thing I noted in that video was how uncreative Liquid played buying, specifically in their A takes. As we watched this round play out, I want to make it clear that Liquid definitely worked out the kinks and executed some fabulous A hits throughout this tournament. So, what Liquid are going to do here is pull attention towards short A with their utility in a bid to catch the defenders watching it too closely, leaving them open to a burst through the showers. I really like the creativity here, A site almost entirely revolves around short A and control of it, so abusing it to get your site control is very creative. The round starts with Liquid a bit spread out to cover in case a B pushes by the defense, but three players including the spike are already out behind showers to execute the take. Echoes on Omen starts off by dropping both of the smokes in front of Teleporter, essentially blocking off the whole sight line from sight towards short. This is almost always done as a means of pushing U Haul without fighting the Heaven or Sight player. You can even watch how the two A players are focusing their attention on these smokes and not really worrying about showers. With these smokes up, the other Liquid players rotate over, with Link really cementing the information pressure by running his Owl Drone up short. It's rare to see an Owl Drone sent up a lane a team doesn't want to push up right after. So again, you see how Liquid is building the take that they want Nip to see. With the spot on the Heaven player, the take happens very fast, and Omen Paranoia through showers to clear the close boxes in Heaven, and just allows Liquid to storm the site. My favorite thing here is the awareness and trust from Scream. He's undeniably the star of this roster, and he still chose to hang back and do the crucial job of watching the fast teleporter flank. It works perfectly, giving them a free pick to complement their newly gained site control. Another small thing I like here is Eccles teleporting back to showers to smoke heaven safely for him and Scream. Not only does it again suppress location intel from NIP, but it also lets him get Scream onto site cleanly. Following that, Scream sage walls the right side of boxes so that defenders can only swing through the middle of site or U-Haul to attempt this retake. It's an incredibly strong setup and it works out great for Liquid as they end up getting their picks and win the round. The big takeaways here are that Showers is a wildly underutilized lane for A takes. If you can mess with the defenders and make them think it's a split, you can open up massive gas for exploitation in your own matches, as Team Liquid did here. We're going to stick with A attacks here, as I find that B is currently a bit stifled in terms of new and innovative takes. Again, Liquid show us some more key changes in their philosophy of taking A control on Bind. The round starts with the Liquid Squad set up for a full investment A take, 4 short, 1 showers. But NIP have read this, they don't want to concede A controls them and have stacked a third person A for this round. As it starts moving, Echoes uses the same smoke set up for the previous A take we went over, blocking off the site's vision towards short. This time, he throws a different look by instantly tossing a paranoia straight through U-Haul. He then complements it with this ultimate usage. 
Now, as someone who has been critical of Liquid Strats, this is simply awesome to watch play out. Eccles teleports back into this corner, the Heaven Blind Spot. But the NIP players react to it in a weird way. We don't get the perspective, but this spot is so close to the Heaven Ramp that Kriya undoubtedly assumed it was a teleport into Heaven. He merely teleports up himself to contest with the supposed flanking player, but Eccles isn't even there, he's down on the site in the ultimate blind spot. And just poor Lucker, falling victim to some bad luck, and suddenly Liquid have just cut the site in half and secured control. They even used the sage wall that I personally despise in most cases, but look at their post plan. Eccles is there to create the disruption needed to increase their odds of winning the round. NIP end up choosing to back off and save, but just what a round from Eccles. Really, really brilliant play. Jumping over to the lower bracket final between Liquid and FPX, we find ourselves in an interesting situation. I don't think it's far off to say that Sage is Valorant's most polarizing and important agent. The combination of stall utility, heals, and the sheer game-breaking potential of her wall and ultimate make her, since beta, considered a near must pick. But that's the thing, near is the operative word. It's totally possible to function without Sage, but especially in regular play it can feel stifling to approach a game when your team doesn't have her. But a great way to get over this hump is to see what pros can do with Sage's team compositions. FPX throughout this tournament would flex their Sage pick depending on map and matchup and would almost always swap for a breach to complement the faster pace on offense while maintaining some form of delay on defense. The problem then becomes on Bind specifically that attacking the A site is much harder without Sage. Look at all of these incredible wall spots that can facilitate takes. You have U-Haul, the truck cutoff, in between truck and stack, and the far side of stack, all of which do different, very helpful things. So how do FBX approach the Sage's A take? They do it like this. Going overhead for a second, they're going to cut the four main sightlines of A to two and prioritize the control of them. The round starts with two towards B for the intel early, one short and two showers. Zipan and Shadow Lulz get into a mild scuffle in Hookah to keep the defense on their toes and guessing where the hit will come from. Meanwhile, Meadow and Angel will start vying for that showers control, pushing Solkaz off and allowing them to set up for the eventual take. Jumping overhead once again quickly, because things are about to move very fast, the players will rotate off of B and we will end up with four short, one showers. Omen will double smoke between truck and stack, as well as heaven. From there, it's all about U-Haul control for the short players and holding the one open sight angle for Meadow in showers. Angel hard paranoias through Hall and Link and teleports across the gap to push into Hall and confirm the first pick. He gets traded by Soulcast, who quickly bags out of Hall to regroup for the retake. Now here is the potential issue of the Sageless take. You have no wall, no heals, and no slows to facilitate some sight control. You have to get more aggressive in this post plant and Breach facilitates this perfectly. Shadow and Zipan push back into U-Haul with the Sovo Drone to help clear angles and Breach gets his ultimate ready to try and delay the retake as long as he can. The best part of Breach's Rolling Thunder is that it can cover such a wide area that from U-Haul, Shadow can hit the whole site and prevent the people within it from being a part of the fight for what feels like ages. The thunder booms and the lightning follows soon after. Liquid are on a back foot timing wise and have to move fast, FPX do well to not give them many free picks, but due to the nature of this style of A-take, FPX can't really move anywhere. So Liquid were able to take the site control and end it in a 2v1 versus Meadow, and this right here is just excellent mechanical awareness from Meadow. He knew that where the spike was planted allowed him to spam wall bang any defuse attempts, and being a cypher, he could save his camera for the ultimate moment and not even make the wall bang here a guess. Most of us was shoulder peak to try and frag the diffuser, and that's almost always a 50-50, and even more costly against one of the best mechanical aimers of any FPS ever in Scream. So he plays his odds perfectly, darts the diffusing Silva in his camera, and gets the wall bang to secure the victory. No one on either side survives, but FPX definitely used everything they had to take A without any of the bounds of help a Sage pick offers. Jumping ahead to round 18 in this match, we are going to take a look at something that's fascinating to me, and that's the anatomy and the probabilities that high level players think about in a clutch. The clutch is the most romanticized play in all of esports. One man alone to save his team, defy the odds and get the miracle win. From chess match 1v1s to David vs Goliath 1v5s, it's something everyone wants to excel in and nothing feels better than outplaying the enemy team when at a disadvantage. But what's often not told is just how hard it is to win in these scenarios. Not only does your aim need to be crisp, but split second decision making can decide the outcomes, and having that ability to make these calls is crucial to any potential success. 
Liquid are going to run a pretty sloppy A take here. It's going to get messy fast, and frankly, we're going to speed through some of this to get to the good stuff. Liquid try to take short A control with just these almond smokes by truck, and FPX just starts shredding them. Our hero of the round screen positions down into Cubby and gets two picks in the melee, including this awesome narrow angle on the soul cast, just showing peak awareness, and here's where it gets good. Link goes down, and Scream gets spotted by the Cypher Ultimate as he scoops the spike and jumps into Teleporter. Here, we need to pause and look at the options Scream has on the table at this moment. He knows at least one was near the Link and Spawn area. One is unknown, but it's a safe guess that the remaining player was a B rotator and thus could still be holding B or have rotated to A early. Scream could do a few things. He can push Hookah and plant B relatively safely and fast, but look at the clock, he has a minute to work with. The first big tip in the clutch is to take stock of these resources. Scream has a res in pocket and a minute to play with. Rushing to plant in a 1v2 is distinctly not in his interest. So let's say B is off the table. He can go market to short A, the classic around the world, the banana swirl. If you know you know, it's safe, it's high odds to maybe even get a res or catch a holdout A player. but. It's expected. It's a known fast rotate from teleport to short and right now Scream can benefit from taking time to really catch FPX by surprise. Another thing to consider is if Scream can res any teammate with useful abilities or ultimates. Going into the round, he knows that Cryptix has a cipher already, and if Scream is lucky enough to get a pick and the res, he can also have the intel of the exact location of the remaining player. So Scream has made up his mind. It's rotate all the way around the sewers. Scout for close defenders, res the homie cryptics, and keep moving in the round. It's hard to say when Scream decides this, or if his teammates also encourage this, but it took us a few minutes of reasoning to think of the optimal play, and it took Scream 20 seconds to get in position to execute it. These are the differences that let players like him excel in the clutch. So, Scream rotates the showers, and Meadow is not expecting this in the least. It's essentially a free frag for the French fragster and the res allows Cryptics to ultimate and identify the last player coming through spawn. From here, the round is swung in Liquid's favor. Scream gets caused by Shadow Lulz after the plant, making his only mistake of the round, but Cryptics plays it perfectly and trades him out for the wind. That kind of awareness and the experience to stay calm in these situations just lets Scream be crispier than a fresh baguette in this clutch and call around for Liquid that they were in a bad position to win. Journeying on over to our second map today, we are back at Split trying to build up an even more robust playbook for such a difficult map. We are starting off in the G2 vs FPX match in the quarterfinals. Round 4, which would normally be the first full buy, but FPX overinvested into forces and are still on the back foot. They are low bot and trying to scramble for some kind of momentum before they get too far in the hole. FPX are going to do something quite unique here, which is fully use Heaven Control on A to make the site clear easier. As opposed to B, A Heaven and A Ramp can be much harder to take and much less worth taking. The way it opens up the site, and with no safe drop down aside from jumping in, it can often be area taken for not much gain. The one upside here is it's much closer quarters than funneling through A Main, and with so many members rallying around a sub, a vandal, and some pistols, this piece of the map is much more probable to fall to them. The round starts, and like a man after my heart, Zipan is going to satchel boost as Ray straight to top ramp. The advantages here is really the surprise factor. If you can start the round with being right up on the defender who made peak ramp, you're certainly likely to die, but you may create an easy trade for your teammates, which is valuable. But there's no one there, and the first of the interesting utility is used. Angel uses his omen smoke to block off the main corridor of A Heaven, which seems weird but it works great in a low buy situation and it allows Zipan to somewhat safely take a look at the rope connector to clear that sharp angle. No picks come from it, but I like the idea. The pace slows down for just a second as FPX get ready for the big peek into heaven to trade for control. Zipan takes the sacrifice for the boys and acts as a crosshair bait on David P and lets his teammates get the quick trade. So you have heaven control. Good. Now what? Well. With no knowledge of players on site, jumping out the window is a suicide pact. And I've honestly never seen this, but Angel is going to smoke deep into defender spawn. Then they are going to use a sage wall, just past the doorway to spawn and essentially slice the spawn in half, allowing the attackers to funnel down into screens and create an awesome split take for the site. Pun fully intended. From screens and main, they can split up petty tech sight lines and blow the site open and get the plant down. From the plant, 
The retake goes perfectly. Angel gets himself a sweet 4K and FBX demonstrate an awesome potential eco strap for Split, which based on my match history, uh, I may need more of these. I am uh, creating a reputation of being the guy who pokes holes at these very bare bones Sage Wall attacking strats because generally I'd prefer to have Sage's Wall deny map access to defenders instead of cutting up potential site control for attackers. And it just so happens that one of these exists for Split B. We've all seen it. It goes a bit like this. You want to push B. If you're like me, you like to swing towards the rope to heaven to get some side control for the boys. You're exiting the garage and boom, ice wall. Teammates getting picked off by heaven players just poking grapes that pop above the wall. When done bad, this is legit one of the worst uses of utility in Valorant, period. But what happens when it's done right? FPX, I think, cracked the formula. And if you can coordinate it, I love how this take plays out. About 40 seconds into the round, after some opening thrusts for intel from both teams, FPX move into position. Angel really shows his chops as a leader here, facilitating the big parts of this take. He starts by throwing a standard smoke into heaven, the POV cuts, and we see the rest of this take happen real fast. The smoke flies out from Angel. Breach uses his slam through pillar to clear someone standing by the default plant spot, followed by his sage slow into back corner of sight as Jet dashes in while Angel uses his omen ult to pop into that corner as well. It scares Pith into shooting the teleport, which allows Jet to immediately trade him. We quickly cut back to the sage wall up with cyber cages on top of it to cut off the headshot angles from heaven. This is all happening inside of 10 seconds. Shadow Lulz really secures the round with a breach ultimate towards heaven that just decks David P. And, oh, what's this? Meadow on the heaven flank the entire time? FPX blows up this site in a nuclear way I've rarely seen. If in my previous guide, the NA version of this take was reliant on a jet dash and aim duels, this version from EU was reliant on a jet and every single other ability that FPX had at their disposal. Jumping over to the upper bracket final between G2 and Liquid, we see the grudge match between the consensus top two European teams. This match was an absolute brawl, and I really recommend you go watch it. As it was super brawly, very little in-depth strategy was going on. It really was just both teams taking gigantic shots at each other, which is why we're here at the pistol round, because G2 rock Liquid early on with this innovative pistol strat. G2 set up their defense with make control strictly in mind. On the pistol round, the otherwise giant sign that says no, that is mid on split, can actually be exploited due to the lack of utility and weaponry by the defense. As such, it's not uncommon to see teams go for mid splits to B or A on their pistol rounds. G2 have one player anchoring each site with Patty Tech keeping it long distance with Omen utility on A and Pith doing cypher things on B. That leaves Wardell, Artis, and David P to push down mid and get in there. They play passive at first, waiting out Omen smokes and rope room, but once they see the re-smoke towards the B side, they start creeping downstairs. Let's watch the minimap as Artis gets this pick onto Eccles. Not only do G2 immediately haul ass off mid, Watch how inside of B Garage, Soulcast bags off and heads towards mid to help his teammates. But who is this creeping right behind him? It's Pith, just sneaking through Garage and making his way to where he knows the liquid players are, which is mid. Pith ends up in a situation that many people may find themselves, and it's one of the hardest to execute on. And that's seeing multiple enemies, but them not seeing you. This is one of the trickiest situations in a game like Valorant. On one hand, you can just give real-time callouts of enemies to your teammates. On another, it's a potential for one or more free frags that could disrupt the entire round. And even then, every single moment you wait to act, someone could just turn around and spoil your whole ploy. The best advice I can give you, if you find yourself in this situation, is to relax. Just as we went over in the clutch scenario, level heads prevail, and if you can have good trigger discipline, you can do this. Now obviously Pith is an incredible pistol player and does highlight stuff like this in his sleep, but, if you can be aware of what your team is doing, you can abuse this kind of map control on defense. It's like getting aggressive and lurking merge into one demonic combo designed to just mess with the attackers. This kind of discipline, to let players walk by, can also be applied to other places as well. Like hiding in an off angle or weird corner. It's just a good rule of thumb. If someone walks by you without noticing, and there's more than one enemy alive, let them go by for a second, because it could pay off in a big way. Real quickly, before we head off to our next game, I wanted to quickly go over this bonkers jet spawn peak that G2 used one time on offense. It did nothing for them, but the concept here is crazy. In attacker spawn, follow the video and sage wall onto this box. It allows jet players to use both upward dodges in conjunction with the ultimates in air accuracy to snipe straight into ramp room briefly. 
I think it's a great one-off spot to try and get a cheeky insta-frag, and it's just cool to see stuff like this be adapted into pro play, as it's so weird and niche that it would appear at first glass to be totally nothing. But even if you get no picks from this, you can spot a defender in ramp, which is important for your A executes. Alright, and here we are at Ascent for our last map today. Let's take a moment to talk about the economy once again as we look at this third round in the Grand Finals between G2 and FPX. So, one of the quirks of the economy in Valorant is that if you win the pistol round, you've gained the economic advantage, but it's very much temporary. The round after, you are in a weird spot. You want to buy up subs, marshals, the occasional bulldog or vandal, as well as full armor and utility. You want to insulate your odds against the probably full eco players going into that round. The problem is, the investment to buy up for an anti-eco round means that you head into the first gun round on round 3 with a worse economy than whoever lost the pistols. If you lose the pistol and full save the round after as we've covered in the past, on round 3 you can buy 5 vandals or phantoms, full armor and utility. But whoever won the pistol is dealing with the leftovers of the previous rounds, either having lost players and having to rebuy entirely or being stuck with those cheaper weapons. All of this is the same, that one of the problems you will face in your games is if you win your pistol round, you will have to deal with a worse buy on the first gun round. This issue is magnified on defense where you really want the extra firepower to lock down choke points, which is why I really enjoy how G2 choose to play this round. As we've covered in the past, they are going to get hyper aggressive in mid control, but I like how fast they choose to play. Instead of holding mid forever, they just get right into the mix. The round starts with Patty Tech smoking off B-Link and pushing up Catwalk as his teammates push out bottom mid. What's good to know here is that Patty Tech doesn't hesitate to push all the way to top mid. It should be noted that most people really don't contest mid from the top when attacking. It's almost always through the B link. And with the commonality of lurking attackers to just hold for A aggression, Patty Tech has great odds to get the free frag, which he does. Another small thing is the instant top mid smoke to allow him to back off safely, not getting too greedy and losing one of their few rifles. What plays out next is just brilliant in my eyes. The smoke clears in B-Link, so Mixwell starts laying down jet smokes and catches shadow lulls trying to walk through it. Patatek sees that and waits a moment before tossing his paranoia through the B-Link to push the attackers off. This almost always signals a push, but G2 aren't interested. Patatek smokes deep B-Link to effectively shut the attackers out of mid and allows Mixwell to grab an upgrade for his Spectre as they begin to fall off. It's a small thing, but I see it done wrong all the time. Learning when to back off of a push is so key to being a high level player. G2 could continue to assault the attackers on the back foot, but there's no need. They know they are outside of B, with not much time left in the round, so it's much better to reinforce the sights than get greedy. From here, it's a good old meat grinder. Out B and G2 secure the round in convincing fashion despite the deficit in gear going in. In the past, we've talked about the issues with playing for passive mid control while defending on ascent, but we haven't looked at an example of it working well. Here we are at round 8 of the Grand Finals. This round is going to play out very slowly because G2 are essentially going to do nothing until FPX decide to reveal what site they are taking. Something I don't believe we've covered yet is what goes into making reads. When we say reads, we mean when a player makes a prediction of what the other team is going to do ahead of it happening. It's one of those concepts like winning clutches that comes with playtime and experience, but there are a few things to consider when trying to make reads. Let's analyze this from the perspective of Petitech as he makes the key move in this round. You're playing from tree room and holding for a mid to A from the attackers. About 40 seconds in, you see an omen smoke that covers the corridor to heaven window, which is almost always a sign of the tree push, so you quickly toss a return smoke to cut off catwalk. You see a few players tagged by a Silva Scandard and know that the attackers are probably centralized in mid and just got pushed off of their chance to take tree room. In this situation, what are the likely outcomes? Attackers could go all the way to A main, but for me this is the least likely after being pushed off of tree room. They can go B lane to B main, or bottom mid to garage. Regardless at this point, the probability is high that FPX do some sort of B hit. So watch the minimap. As FPX push up mid, Patatech is rotating fast off the reeds to reinforce the B site. With the read in effect, the benefits of passive mid holding comes through. This late into the round, G2 have 3 players at full health with a lot of utility up and ready to hold against the B take. The attackers funnel through Garage, and from here, it's a bit of luck in the gunfights for G2 to win this round. David P and Artist deal the first blows, but FPX respond in kind with 2 picks right back, with only Artist left in Boathouse with 1 HP. He manages to snake a reload and get a clutch headshot on Meadow, giving his team enough time to come in and clean up the remainder. I think it's important to note, that there's a fine line between blind guesses and making reads. 
there is always the potential to be wrong in your reads, but the very best players minimize the margin for error by making sure to play heads up and keep an eye on the information they have in front of them. We're going to wind down today's video with a more simplified, pacey B hit that G2 showcased in this game. While I enjoy greatly breaking down the complex and nut strategies we are seeing develop at the pro level, it's equally important to touch on the standard and simple takes because mastering those is important for all of us to continue leveling up our game. Look at the econ for G2 here going into this round. It's a scrappy third round buy because they won the pistol and thus they are definitely undergeared compared to FPX. So they make the right call in my opinion. Keep it simple, execute a fast B take and use those faster moving weapons like pistols and subs to their greatest effect. The standard B take on Ascent revolves around two smokes, one for alley and one for garage. From there, it's bursting into sight and getting down speed lane fast to secure sight. In my opinion, it's not worth to dedicating everyone to scrapping in this open area in front of garage as it's easy to get stuck and then get wrecked. I like that G2 has some scrapping near garage, but they also prioritize getting the plant down and the site control. They burst out of garage and quickly get trades in their favor. By the time the spike is planted, G2 gets 3 picks at the cost of 1 pith and it's all marvelously done. From here it's a 4v2 and basically unwinnable for FPX. Another small thing I want to point out is the sage wall by David P. What an awesome little off angle to catch garage players lacking. But other than that one wall, it was 2 smokes and some coordination that let G2 win this round despite the economic disadvantage. And remember, if you want to improve, win more gunfights, and get the rank you've always wanted, then check out skillcap.com, link in the description below. And that's all we have for today. What team do you guys think is the best in Europe currently? Let us know in the comments down below. And while you're down there, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to get more premium guides like this one, with one goal in mind, helping you become a better player. We here at Skillcapped want to thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.